The skim, quite simply, uh, makes it easier to live smarter. There's a lot of noise out there. We're gonna clear the weeds and we're gonna make it easier to understand what's going on in the world. How we expanded was really thinking about what are all of the, what we call the life necessity categories of our lives. How do we make money? How do we think about our health, our physical health, our mental health, our health insurance? How do we think about the purchases that we need to make? And how do we think about our rights and then how can we clear the noise around all of those things and make it easier to live smarter? I think people make sometimes the mistake when they're thinking about starting their own company or they have an idea that you need to know what it's going to look like 10 years from now. Um, you know, we're, we're going on nine years of the company. When we started, it was the two of us with an idea on our couch and with our computer. The DNA of what we wanted to do is still in the company today, but the how and how much bigger it can be is something that we revisit all the time. And now you have to watch our podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Be Your Own Boss podcast. I'm Blake here with my co-host, Jacob, and today we have some very special guests, Danielle Weisberg and Carly Zakin, the founders of The Skim. Danielle and Carly, welcome. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Thanks for having us. Hi. So I have to off the bat say, Danielle, we both had babies within three months of uh I don't what each other. My son is no each other. I think so. Yeah. What's the correct? How you guys old can um, correct our grammar today? He's one years old. He just turned one. Yes. So Gabe turns nine months next week. Ah. Uh, so and I can't believe it. So you guys have been so busy, and I mean, I think the best first question for you is just like, what happened to your lives in the past year? Um, you know, it's been really calm. Yeah, like, Danielle, you, you do um, it. <laughs> you had a more than Yeah, year. <laughs> no. So, you know, it's kind of insane when I, uh, I can't remember what the exact date is, but I think like March 12th is that when that was the day collectively said like all of the craziness broke out. Right. So March 12th, I remember Carly was on vacation in Mexico and she was debating like, should I go? Should I not? And I was like, you should definitely go. Like, this is going to be fine. What's going to happen? Like, you should go. Go on vacation. I'll be fine. And then um, I, while she was gone, like, made the somewhat decision to uh, close the office down as a test run where I was like, how about we just do a tech day where uh, let's see if we can work remotely. Um, so it was a like a, a – Thursday that I was packing up all my stuff thinking that we would, you know, work remotely that following Monday, we gave people Friday off. And I was leaving the office. Um, and I was, I think around like six weeks pregnant. Like I did, I wasn't telling anyone. Um, no, maybe I was a little bit further along, but my family didn't know aside from like, you know, my dad. Um, and I haven't been back to the office since which is crazy that I will go back with like an 18 month old child. Um, and from that, it's been the craziest ride. Um, I give our team so much credit that we've been fully remote since that day and we've learned how to adjust. Um, I will say it is, I am in awe of the women who are working for us at the skim who have, multiple kids at home who have had to homeschool, who have had to make impossible decisions. And I just am like, when did you get this done? How do you actually do this? And they are just juggling things that should not have to be on top of what we all do every day. Um, and I think that that has been the hardest time is you want to give your team flexibility. You want to give your team um, you want to be empathetic for, for what we've all gone through. And at the same time, we want to create stability. We want the company that we've all worked so hard to create, not just to survive, but to thrive. And I think those decisions have been, you know, at the crux of, of kind of what the past 15 months have been like for us. Yeah, it hasn't been, hasn't been easy for sure. Uh, why don't we start with a little bit of background information about the skim? So people who are not familiar with the company, 
What do you guys do? And can you take us a little bit through your journey of how you created the company and built it into what it is today? And maybe Carly, we can start with you and then uh, Danielle, you can chime in as well. Sure. Uh, we're used to trading off. Uh, so the skim quite simply uh, makes it easier to live smarter. And you know, it's, it's crazy to look back, we're gonna turn nine um, next month. And our mission statement has been the exact same since the second we launched. And our focus on this audience of millennial women has been the exact same. And the reasons for what we do and why we do it have just really intensified over these last nine years. So when we started, we we really focused uh, on news. We said, there's a lot of noise out there. We're gonna clear the weeds and we're gonna make it easier to understand what's going on in the world. And how we expanded was really thinking about what are all of the, what we call the life necessity categories of our lives. How do we make money? How do we think about our health, our physical health, our mental health, our health insurance? How do we think about the purchases that we need to make? And how do we think about our rights? And then how can we clear the noise around all of those things and make it easier to live smarter? And so when I talk about kind of the focus on this audience and, and how that started and kind of what the, the nexus of that was and where it grew to, to get to today, um, it's really because there's never been a generation like this before. There's never been her before. She's been leading in paychecks and degrees. She's been out earning her male counterparts. Uh, she has been getting a seat at the table where we've all watched it actually happen more than ever in these last nine years. Um, and she is the household decision maker. Like she controls the purse strings. Sorry, Jacob. <laughs> at the no, same time. I, I, I've expected <laughs> Jacob's that. Like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, but I've come at this to, uh, to respect my, my overlord. All the things you're saying, I'm like, oh my God, this is this is me. I, you're like speaking to well, like, He's except, used to it. Yeah. Like this is you. And then on the other side of that is we've been drowning in student debt. We can't afford our first homes. We're having kids later in life. Our parents are going to be our dependents. We might not have social security. Like we're thinking about all of these things and getting slammed. It's been that much harder for women of color. And then you throw in a pandemic. So when we think about what does the skim do, like we have always made it easier to live smarter. We've grown to make it easier to live smarter in each of the really like adult necessary categories of our lives. But I would say the gravity around that has certainly and unfortunately at times intensified over these last 15 months. Danielle, did you want to chime in there too? I just think it's... Um... <laughs> I think it's it's interesting. I was just thinking about um, a lot of what we talk about is is going back to work and not not necessarily going back to normal, not going back to work, but the idea of what does a return look like, um, and how all of these things, all of these dynamics, have come together to really put millennial women and, and women in general in this bind that as a society, we need them to stay in the workforce, right? We need them to um, to continue to participate in the labor market. I mean, that benefits all of us, right? They're able to have kids, we're able to have social security, all of these things. And yet when we talk about, you know, birth rate potentially declining, like we're, we're seeing that, that this is not just an issue because I feel passionate about a generation that I'm a part of. Of course, that's part of it, but it's really a societal issue. And I think that that gets lost a lot of time when you talk about why it's so important that we support women. Um, and I think that now is really the time to do that. And you see proposals, whether it's, you know, um, what President Biden's administration is doing or the Marshall Plan for Moms or a caregiving czar that really put it into a political context. And all of those things, you know, have elements that I completely support and they should be out there and talked about. And then there's also what Carly and I talk about a lot, which is more of the private sector. Um, how how do we as companies contribute to this responsibility? And how do you do that at a time when, you know, as, as companies too, we're trying to get you know, growth, profitability back on track after a year where everyone was set back. Um, and I think that it is a really hard um, line to walk and the conversations need to be had now because what we're seeing too is that more people go back to 
the office in person. What we don't want to have happen is, you know, these women that took a step back or that chose to um, prioritize working, like getting their kids up in remote school. And I say chose when it, it's really, you know, that that's not quite the right term. It was like, how the hell do I do this in this impossible environment? Um, this is the, the right decision in a time when I never thought I would have to make one. Um, and we don't want to see what we're scared of seeing is that places open and you have a, uh, a hybrid or remote policy. And then you see the male counterparts in the office and does FaceTime start to get valued higher? And then a year, two years from now, what do those promotions look like? Right when, you know, two years ago, women were in these leadership positions. Um, and yet on the other side, we all know that there's so much to be gained for not having commute time, uh, being able to, you know, I'll speak from it. Like my, my nine month old is in the other room. I feel like the silver lining for me is that I haven't missed out on any of those moments. I've been able to pop in. Um, and there's not a right answer for all of this, but everything needs to be on the table because going back shouldn't look like what we went back to. Uh, that's not going to work well for anyone or for a society that really needs this audience to thrive moving forward. Yeah, I know for us as a couple, we have two kids. We had a baby a year ago. And I always tell Jacob, like, I just can't imagine what it's like for women because I have every advantage and I'm, you know, I'm an earner. I give myself um, advantages that I didn't with my first child. Like we had a night nurse, like, and I'm pulling my hair out and I just can, I have so much empathy for women that they're just stuck between a rock and a hard place right now. And it's so great that you guys are advocating for women and you're bringing awareness to these issues. Speaking of women, you guys have an incredible board. Um, it also seems uh, a little bit intimidating when you guys do your presentations to the board because your board includes an audience of Shonda Rhimes, Mariska Hargitay, Tyra Banks, Sarah Blakely. You got the New York Times on your board. So anyway, can we talk about your board and what it's like, you know, having such a dynamic board, especially of strong female personalities as well? Yeah, well, just to clarify, um, those those people that you just mentioned are actually all investors, um, yes. all minority investors. Um, our board of directors is separate from that. Um, so we have incredible people on our board of directors, um, including Alan Golston, who's the um, president of the Gates Foundation, Betsy Morgan, uh, an amazing media entrepreneur. Um, we have Google Ventures. Uh, we have Homebrew Ventures. So amazing board members. And I think there's sort of two parts to what you're asking. I think the first is what was it like to raise funding from some of those amazing investors that we're so proud to have on our cap table? And then the second is how do you learn how to manage a board? Um, raising money was the single hardest thing we've either of us have ever gone through um, professionally. Uh, we, we had no business background before we started the skim. And I think there was a learning curve in that. There was a learning curve in, you know, financial vernacular and jargon. And that's part of what inspired us to launch Skim You and Skim Money to really bring financial literacy to, to others so that they don't have to go through that. Um, but there also was, I think, a real lack of market understanding around what it is we wanted to do and what we had built already. Um, I think, you know, we've talked about this a lot publicly before, but we would literally be emailed from invest potential investors saying email is dead. And we're like, you just emailed that. Um, we were told more times than I can count on, on two hands uh, that women are a niche market. And we just talked through all the reasons why that is offensive and completely wrong and also really bad business. Uh, and we were told that you know we couldn't do this unless we had a technical co-founder. Um, so I think when we think about who is around us, as investors, these are people that believed in what we were doing, that saw the proof in the pudding and the stickiness of the product from day one, but also saw the vision before it existed um, and, and have been along on the journey with us. I think also uh, the amazing women that you mentioned, uh, you know, like Tyra, like Shonda, um, like Sarah Blakely and, and others, uh, we worked really hard to have them involved. We re last raised capital in 2018 uh, and Google Ventures led that. And we could have closed that deal, you know, let's, you know, 
very quickly, we were oversubscribed and, and we kept the deal open um, for a few weeks so that we could really make sure that we had women represented on our cap table. That was really, really important to us as female founders and female CEOs to ensure that. Um, and as for managing a board and learning how to do that, I don't know, Danielle, if you want to take that. Yeah, it's been a real education over time. Um, I think that it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. Our, our first board meeting was um, over drinks at a bar from below our office. And it was right after we raised our seed round. Um, and our lead, who's still, you know, part of our, our board today, said, this doesn't have to be anything more than like an update, but I want to get you guys in the practice of having quarterly board meetings. Um, and gradually now those have grown into quarterly board meetings that, you know, are two hours and have a lot more uh, deeper questions than, you know, how strong do you want this drink? It's really about like, what is the three-year plan? What's the five-year plan? What do you guys want? You know, who are the key decision makers at the company? Um, and I think that as entrepreneurs, you have the skill sets that really fall into your wheelhouse. So things for us are storytelling, it's the creative direction, it's the brand identity, and the things that um, haven't, you know, weren't things that we had in the beginning were really, I would say, um, the projections, the more, the harder skills. Um, and I think over time, we've, you know, learned that to create a sustainable vision, you have to marry the two and to surround yourself with people that can help you do that. Um, and I think that once we did, ultimately the board discussions got a lot um, more productive. Um, we also you know, don't hesitate to, to call on them for help. So I think part of our philosophy with the board is there shouldn't be any surprises. Um, you can't, or we don't think you, you should hide things, right? It's about being proactive with um, what the issues you're facing. And, and last year, you know, we were talking to them every week because we didn't know what was going to happen. And we were drawing on them, not just for their expertise, um, but also for the fact that they sit on other boardrooms and they're seeing these issues, not just at our meeting, but what's going on with their other companies. One of the things that I, I really like, uh, so we've interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs on this show, and I think most of the entrepreneurs we've interviewed have a physical product, like they make... Uh, yeah, a drink or, you know, it's something physical, but there are also a lot of entrepreneurs. And I think we do this as well, that are really focused on the digital space where it's not a physical product, but it's a digital one. And so you guys have over 7 million subscribers. You've created so many amazing digital products. You have hundreds of employees. So I'm really interested in kind of the genesis of how you grew to that. Um, so originally it's just the two of you. Can you give us a little bit of insight on what was your strategy to grow to over 7 million subscribers and to build this digital media empire that you guys have now? I know that's a big question, but no, it's, I think it's, you know, it's a big it's, question, uh, but it's, oh, sorry, go ahead, Danielle. No, I was going to say it's a big question, but it's, in some ways it's not because, you know, I think we always had the, well, I should say that I think people make sometimes the mistake when they're thinking about starting their own company or they have an idea that you need to know what it's going to look like 10 years from now. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're going on nine years of the company. When we started, it was the two of us with an idea on our couch and with our computers. So, you know, it, it's kind of twofold. One, we had a strong enough idea and vision and conviction um, that was married with the needs of a millennial audience, the business case on why we can monetize them and why there is a, a big addressable market. And then finally, the passion, right? And that all came together. Um, but at the same time, that grows. And um, that's where the fun and, and the uncertainty comes in. Um, so we started off the two of us writing, you know, throughout the night editing, and then would spend our days trying to get the business off the ground. And then we hit a point where it really made sense to bring on more money, um, or bring on money period, because it couldn't just be the two of us. Um, and we had enough proof by then to know that there was an audience and a community behind us that was hungry for this and knew we had something different. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I feel like that initial 
spark. Um, that initial DNA is really the foundation. And that's why we've been able to grow a brand that still resonates um, and continues to have deep roots with our audience. At the same time, if you had asked us like, you know, in nine years, where do you see yourself? I wouldn't have said, oh, we're going to have like 119 employees and we're going to have this crazy year where everyone worked remotely, but it's okay. Um, or you're going to have, you know, different revenue streams and, you know, um, and at the same time, I wouldn't have said, you know, we're just going to have 10 employees and we're going to be doing something smaller. Um, and I think that's okay. Like the, the DNA of what we wanted to do is still in the company today, but the how and how much bigger it can be is something that we revisit all the time. Hmm. Yeah. Do you spend a lot of time networking with other millennial female founders because I feel like you guys are like the poster women for millennial, you know, successful founder business women. I mean, do you spend a lot of time or did you pre COVID doing that? Well, even, even for men, successful entrepreneurs in general. I mean, I look at that and I'm thinking like, my God, you know, I, I think of how hard it is for us to like build an email newsletter where you have to create a lead magnet and you get people to download it and you get maybe, but it's know, harder for women. And so no, there's yeah, like totally agree. not, I mean, I wouldn't say there's like tons and tons and tons of like successful business women that it's yeah. easy. I mean, I feel like it's always talked about like it's really hard to be female founder. Yeah. I think it's really hard to be first time founders for sure. And it's definitely harder to be female founders. And we are, um, you know, very aware that very well aware that it is that much harder for women of color who are her first time founders and founders at all. So I think we also recognize the privilege in that. But I think that. When we, um, we were joking about this, I think yesterday, Danielle, like we were like, wow, like people are really excited to like go back to networking. And we were like, mm, I'm not there yet. Uh, I think we were always yeah. a little bit of an anomaly in, the, in that sense. Um, part of that was a, part of that is like our personality. We're both kind of introverted extroverts. So if you ask us like, what's your ideal night? It's not networking. It's like being at home, watching TV with like our family and having a glass yeah, of wine. Like uh, yeah, like, uh, we're like both like no new friends, uh, at the same time, like in their, in their beginning of the skim, you know, when we were doing all jobs, our editorial schedule really dictated our ability to be out at night or to, um, to network or go to anything. And I remember, you know, for the first three years, like we were doing all jobs and we, um, we would tell people like, oh, we, you know we can't stay to this dinner, like, or we'll bring our laptop to dinner. And like, we literally have like a backpack with like our laptop and, or we would like step we out. We went of, to a club with we a, to a club a with a backpack on. and edited wow. in a club. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, I can't even tell you how many that's times. That's not an we, introvert thing, that, you dead, guys. You're not introverts. Right there. There's it, was no thing, it was a working uh, okay. thing. It was not a fun club. Uh, okay. But uh, anyway, so I think for us, we were always like amazed. We're like, don't people have to do work? How do they have time to like build their company if they're out networking all the time? Um, so I think there's a, a little bit of truth in that. At the same time, our whole network was rebuilt um, or expanded, I should say, when we started the skin. Um, we would never have gotten this far if it hadn't been for networking, if it hadn't build, been for building out our amazing advisory board, um, for having like you know, an emergency list of who do we call with SOS questions, which we do all the time still. Um, and I think that that, you know, is something that we talked a lot about in, in our book, um, How to Skim Your Life around, you know, we call kind of the, the stalker spreadsheet, which is being really, really <laughs> diligent about um, keeping, uh, being really diligent about keeping a track of who you're meeting with, being really diligent about keeping track of how often you're in touch with them um, and staying on it. And so that was something we were always really, really strong about and I think helped us get us this far. Before we continue with our show, we just wanted to remind you to download our new PDF, which outlines all the great tools we use to run our seven figure business. It's called the Entrepreneur's Online Business Toolkit and you can grab it at byobtools.com. Again, that is byobtools.com. What about the, the growth aspect? Because um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs would be really interested in how you grew to, to 7 million, because I think that the traditional approach, like I said, a lot of people, 
everybody wants to grow their email newsletter list and they put out lead magnets and they promote stuff on social media and then they wonder if should they even be doing email and we know how you started where you were like stealing email not stealing but you like grabbed we never stole email. an email address no not that you stole but you, you had like the which read, email no yeah, i yeah. read you you took facebook e- you took emails off of your your oh, facebook we did. contacts Yes, the That's well, we, we, we never signed them up. We took those. We at the, in those days you could download your Facebook friend list, and so we would email our Facebook friend list and be like, "Can you please sign up? We just quit our jobs. Please, like, be nice to us." So then they would sign up, but we never. We actually were always really careful not to just sign people up because that's how we kept good engagement. <laughs> can you talk about for for entrepreneurs who are out there now who would love to learn how they can? Well, first. I already know the answer to this question. Is email dead? And second, for people who are trying to grow their email newsletter list, any suggestions or tips, uh, anything that you have learned over the past nine years that you think entrepreneurs need to know about when it comes to email? Yeah. Um, so no, I don't think email is dead because people have been telling us email is dead since before we started. Um, so I think that's the first thing. I, I think that people mistake email as being something that you know, is, is totally different than it's just a platform, right? It's, it's one medium of communication, one method. And with that, your strategy should match the medium. You shouldn't be on email just to be on email. How many emails do we all get a day? When we started, you know, one, our, our vision at the time was how can we recreate the idea of morning television? So how do you wake up? What do you check first? The first thing that we did wasn't to turn on a TV. I didn't own a TV. Um, so it was very much like, well, what do I check? I grab my phone and I read email. So email fit into that routine. Um, and a lot of how we create products is this routine idea of we want her to wake up with us and then we want to be there for her throughout the day. So she keeps coming back to us, whether it's in person, whether it's um, online, whether it is on a device, um, we follow her. And email was then fitting into a specific time of day. Um, And so we thought about how much time does she have? Um, the, the thoughts around images where she doesn't have a lot of time and she's commuting, you don't want to wait for something to load. Um, and you know, she might be on a subway. Uh, it video, does video really make sense? Do you have your headphones all the time? What's going to happen if you lead it? That could be another product for us. So all of those thoughts went into why we chose email. I think where we see people make a mistake is that they're like, should I be on email? It's really, what do you want to get out of it? What are you trying to put out there? And with that, which platform makes sense? Um, So we've been, you know, now we've launched many different verticals and we have other products. um, And email to us has been our bread and butter, I think, because we've been so um, just thoughtful on on why it fits into our ecosystem. Hmm. And I guess email you control. Uh, That's the thing Blake and I talk about sometimes, right? Where... Sometimes we'll build up a pretty good sized following on social media, but then we realize that we don't actually own that. And so if LinkedIn or if somebody changes their algorithm, that can all go away. And so if you get people into your email list, you can control and own that. And I think a lot of people forget that you don't actually own anything that is built on somebody else's platform. Yeah, that's another reason why it makes a lot of sense as a business. Um, It also means that you need to mean something. Um, because what we see is, you know, you can, um, the, I think people measure in scale, right? So when you say numbers, you also have to press for the engagement because if you're spending so much time sending something out and no one's opening it, then that also isn't the way that you're owning or activating your audience. Um, so I think that is equally as important, but when we saw everyone, you know, rush to, this is dating ourselves, but like Facebook live or Snapchat or Instagram or now TikTok, like those are great platforms and extensions. And we've chosen to be big on Instagram because that's where, you know, our prime audience is. But at the end of the day, we always think about how much effort, how much cost we put into that because we don't own it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to go back to something about advertising. You know, the news to me is always a little bit dicey because you know someone is making money off of the stuff that you're reading and or hearing. So that's a little scary when you think, well, you know, what is this person benefit? How does this person benefit from what I'm consuming? Um, I know you guys refused to accept advertising, at least when you launched. So how did you decide how you were going to make revenue? And can you talk about that strategy? 
Yeah, so you're right. We did um, turn down um, a lot of incoming brands that wanted to work with us early on. And a a huge part of the reason was, to be perfectly honest, we didn't have the bandwidth um, to be able to do that as well as like our writing the newsletter and trying to raise capital and, and trying to build a business. Um, so we, you know, by saying no, we kind of created scarcity in the market for, for this game and reaching our audience. And that ended up benefiting us for sure. But um, we've always been really, really selective about who we work with. And I think one of the reasons that we have such a high re- um, client renewal rate and brands, you know, constantly want to work with us is, is two things. One, brand safety, they know that like we are in, you know, we're all incentivized in the same way to make sure that our audience and our, and the brands that we partner with are protected by how we're featuring them in the newsletter, how we're integrating them. Um, so that it never actually, uh, could jeopardize the journalistic integrity of what we put out there on any of our platforms. Thing two is that, you know, to your point earlier about social channels, um, there's lots of companies that have bigger audiences than ours. Uh, We intentionally grew our brand very differently, um, very methodically. So it wasn't, we never made a scale play. While we have achieved scale, what we really did was an engagement play. And so the other reason that brands like to work with the skim is because if they want to get in front of a captive audience um, that is actually paying attention to what we're putting in front of them, they see the results with the skim. And and that's where we just seen time and time again, successful activations from everything from our civic engagement work, where we have had an unprecedented number of of women in particular registered to vote over um, nearly a million over the last three election cycles, um, to our work with skim money and over 77,000 of her showing up to a fidelity sponsored virtual event series about finance. Um, to launching Skim Well, which we did with WW. Um, we continually see just incredible, incredible activations with our audiences. Are you guys able to share your open rates or is that top secret classified? No, I mean, we, we will just say that they're um, really unprecedented and they you know differ by product, um, but it's strong and that, that's been a balance. It's yeah. been very strategic as we've grown, which is, you know, we do... Um, look at cohorts, we look at sources of growth, and then we look at even if something is bringing in a high volume of growth, we want to look at how they perform over time and then adjust our growth strategy with that in mind. So one more uh, email question for you, and that is for entrepreneurs who are watching and listening, how do you advise them to develop an email strategy? Uh, Because it seems like you guys put a lot of thought and effort into understanding your audience, how they're consuming the content. So how do you start building a strategy? And at the same time, I mean, you are you also need to make money, right? I mean, you have to sell. So how do you balance creating that email content, but at the same time, not being so pushy? Because I've subscribed to some email newsletters from, um, I won't name any names, but they'll send out something like every day. Hey, buy this, buy that. Here's a discount. I know that yeah. people didn't buy that. You know, click here. And it's just like too much. So how do you balance that and uh, any advice on creating an email strategy for entrepreneurs? I think it, you know, it's the same advice I would give whether it was email or a physical product. It's the same advice, um, which is who, who are you building for? Like know your audience and what are, what is the problem that you're solving? What is the need that you're filling? And I think if you can answer those two things, you know, clearer than you can answer your own mission statement, then you have something. Um, and email, you know, is the how, it's the strategy around like how to deliver against that. And so if you know that like, this is my key audience, this is when they're going to need an email like this, this is when they're going to open it. This is something they actually might want to come back to and open again. And they might, you know, favorite it. Um, that's really different than if you're a news outlet that sends breaking news emails multiple times a day. Like that, those are very different value propositions. Not to say that there's not room for both. It's just a very, a very different how in that in that sense. Um, and so I think no matter what your product is or what you're building, you need to know who is it for, who are you talking to, what are you thinking of when you're making product decisions, and then how are they going to use it? Hmm. What's the problem that you're solving? Yeah. I think that it would make sense to close with one message for women watching and and listening. You know, it hasn't been an easy year for anybody. Um, Danielle had a baby. 
I think you lost your mom recently. I mean, it's not an easy time. A lot of people have lost loved ones. What is the one message for each of you that you'd like to leave with? And of course, our male listeners will benefit from this too, but for our women uh, listeners, entrepreneurs, and people that support them. I think, you know, it's... I think empathy goes a long way. Um, Everyone is going through a hard time and you might not realize it or you might not understand. Um, And I think that putting empathy first when you can or even just thinking about it, I think that that can can be a game changer. It doesn't change what you're going through. Um, It doesn't change the resources that you have. But I think it is at times, you know, it is a tool that I I think people underestimate how powerful it can be. And Carly, do you have anything to add? I totally agree with with what Danielle just said. And I I think what we've seen this, you know, as we kind of started this conversation, we talked about, you know, going back to work. We talked about the idea of the great return that everyone keeps talking about. And, you know, at the scam, you know, Danielle and I are calling it like her turn the great her turn. Like we don't want to go back. And part of how we want to go forward to build the workplace that we want and to build the company cultures that we want to work for and and to work at um, is to really ask for what you need. And to then on the other side, if you're the employer to to respond with that sense of empathy. Um, And so to me, they, they actually go hand in hand. Yeah, so I'd like to wrap up with our rapid fire round, which is a fun and lighthearted quick session where we ask you things not related to business necessarily. Are you guys willing right. to do that? Let's do it. We love a rapid fire. We're game. This is our favorite type oh, of interview we'll question. Start. Yeah. You want me to start? Okay. Uh, what is your most embarrassing work moment? Oh. Oh, God. oh I know Danielle. <laughs> oh, I've got one. Okay. I, yeah. Um, so we did our book tour. No. And we were, oh. Okay. Go, Carly's go, go. clearly thinking of a different one. Well, now one. you can't oh, not no. say it. Now yeah, we're I don't know. If you, give a, if you give a different one, then it's like open season. So, um, but no, I was going to say we were on the book tour and the second stop was um, Chicago, which is where I'm from. I had like my whole family sitting in the front row. The audience was like packed and we walk up the stairs and I totally like slipped. I don't even it remember was just, that. It was that was your embarrassing moment. Oh, I don't you know that I thought about it last all. night. Oh my like, God. Daniel, no one knows that. that. No one knows that. Oh you my slipped? gosh, no, that was, you was another thing you were going to no, say. No, Danielle's embarrassing moment should be uh, when we were on Forbes 30 under 30 list, We there was a photo shoot and they had... Um, oh, that's funny. This is good. Blake one. Lively yeah. was there and there was a <laughs> rack of clothes and they all, you know, looked very like corporate clothes. And then there was, but this one coat on this rack and it was this beautiful. And they told us we could choose from the rack. There was a beautiful light blue coat. Danielle puts it on and she looks like she's like in a movie. Like I was like, where did you find the coat on the rack? Like what else can I find? And this woman comes over and goes, excuse me, that's Miss Lively's coat. And it was like Oscar <laughs> de Laurentiis coat or something. It was like, excuse me, can you please take off Miss Lively's personal coat? And I just look and she's like staring at me like, why is this woman wearing my clothes? Um, anyway, yeah. That's pretty I good. blocked that out. Yeah. I like that one. Like Carly, you. what's yours? I don't have one. Oh, oh, you can't get off the hook that easily. I don't know. Oh. I don't know. You can um, think about it. Maybe more. Danielle has one for Carly. She probably does, but I don't even remember. I'm going to think about it. We can come back to it. Yeah, what, if you think of one, let us know. Yeah. This one's a little easier. What's your greatest joy? Oh, oh um, my baby. Hands down. My family. If you could have dinner with one person, alive or dead, who would it be? I don't like when it's alive or dead. It makes it too hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna choose alive. <laughs> whatever, yeah, whatever you do. Yeah, I'm gonna choose alive. Um, I would really like to sit down with the queen. I have a lot of questions for her. I was gonna say that too. Yeah, totally. I would. I mean, Michelle Obama too would be cool, but like the queen would be. She's seen a lot. She's just seen so yeah, much. I wanna. I wanna yeah. talk to her. Yeah. Um, okay. Next one. Who is the greatest band of all time? 
band. And, uh, oh, well, I, of all time, I mean, I'm a huge Fleetwood Mac fan. So, like, I always play that, like, it's, like, on repeat in my house. Like, it's, like, what I, when I would walk to work, that's what I would be listening to. So, they're my favorite of all time. Um, I think Queen has got to be up there. It's a good band. Um, and I have one that's not on our list, but it just kind of popped into my head. Uh, besides the skim, which, by the way, for people not familiar with it, it's two M's. Besides the skim, is there a resource? It could be a website, a book, anything that you think our listeners, entrepreneurs need to know about. And again, it could be any resource you can think of. Any resource. Yep. Book, website, I don't know. TV show. Something that has helped you during the course of your careers. There's so many things. Um... I, I think ultimately it's like a phone. I know that wasn't listed, but I think picking up and calling people and talking to them is like the most underrated thing. I don't know. We're not big into like the, we love to read, but I very rarely live, read business I books. Actually, the one oh, sorry, that I, I would, I am drawn to is like the secret. And I, I'm not kidding. Like that is, I, I would highly recommend reading it. We did a actually, video it's not like a business book tech. per se, but I think Adam Grant has been, um, even just following him on Instagram, like I just feel like I take so much away from management perspective. Hmm. Yeah, there's a great episode of him on the Dax Shepard, the armchair expert podcast. Yeah, that's a really yeah. good. You guys listen to that? The one with Prince yeah, Harry, you might like if you want to meet. I actually, like, I, I didn't listen to the Prince Harry one. I read the, like, the transcript, basically. Um, it was just, there was so much royal news happening that week. I just, like, needed a break. The best part was when Monica Padman, his, like, assistant or co-host, asks Prince Harry if he's seen the crown. And it's just this very cringeworthy moment where you're like, no, don't ask him that. This is so awkward. Please. Oh, I would have asked that. <laughs> it was good. Well, um, that's all for our interview today. You guys have been awesome. Um, where Thank can you. people learn more about you or The Skim? Go to theskim.com, two M's. Uh, or follow us on Instagram at The Skim or at Carly and Danielle. All right. Well, Danielle and Carly, thank you so much for being our guests on the Be Your Own Boss podcast. And that's all for today. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for tuning into this episode. And if you're interested in learning about the tools we use to build seven-figure businesses, head over to byobtools.com. You'll get a PDF that shows you the breakdown of all the tools that we need to keep our businesses growing. And of course, we would love it if you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just hit that subscribe button and you will get access to more videos just like this one, including interviews with some of the world's top entrepreneurs.